Hey, my name is Pastor Sunil, and welcome to our archive messages. You can join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. in person, or catch us live online. We hope that you're truly blessed by this message, and once again, thanks for tuning in. We are starting a new series here at Faith on transformation, the way that God just gets involved in a person's life and just changes absolutely everything about it. Now, before we get into the message, I'm going to be calling up Nathaniel Ram. He's been giving leadership to a men's small group that meets Saturday mornings right here at Faith. And they've been going through some of the issues of God bringing change into different areas of their lives. So, Nathaniel, would you come and just share a little bit of what God's been doing in the group? Good morning, Faith. It's great to be here and to see you all out. And um, yeah, so I'm going to just discuss a little bit about um, 33, the series, and what's been going on on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. in the cafe. And uh, so 33, it's a men's group. Um, well, it's a men's Bible study, and um, it talks about different aspects of life as we know it today and our society and how to get back to being an authentic man for God and uh, what God has called us to be. So there, this series has six volumes, and each volume has six sessions. So we went through two volumes already, and the first volume, it was called A Man and His Design. So we looked at the current state of manhood, manhood and what has affected our, um, our lives and uh, just different um, world events like wars and um, how men had to go out and fight and how when they came back, they didn't come back the same. They, didn't, uh, they weren't able to relate to their families in the, the proper way, I'd say, um, that God has called us to. And things that happen in one generation, you can see it everywhere. It, a sin or um, just a weakness that uh, starts in one generation, if it's not dealt with, it passes through to the next generation. And um, so that was just one aspect of that first volume. And then the um, second volume was uh, A Man in a Story. How, what has uh, shaped us to be the person we are today? And um, uh, different people, like especially parents, have had a big influence on uh, each man's life. And uh, some, some men are blessed with parents that were, were able to do things pretty well. And then there's some parent, or some men that have uh, had struggles with uh, a parent that was absent or abusive parent. And um, when when this when these hurts aren't dealt with, they they pa they get passed on to the next generation in in uh, negative ways. And um, the whole point of this series is to to bring this to light, to think in a new way. And um, to seek the Lord for wisdom and how to um, grow and uh, be rid of this, these things that may be holding us back. Um, so the, the next series we're going to be starting is A Man in His Traps. Uh, this uh, series is going to discuss um, issues such as uh, sexual lust, the need for control, Fear and the pursuit of significance. So um, this upcoming Saturday, actually, we're just going to be meeting as guys and having a time of um, discussion and also hearing what's God laying on each one's life. And uh, the last few weeks, we've had a real um, sense of we want to do more as men in this church. And... Um, we want to have an impact on our community. So uh, this upcoming Saturday is going to be more of a time of prayer and also, um, yeah, seeing where, as men, we feel God is leading us. So 
yeah, if you're a man, you're definitely welcome to come out next Saturday. We would love to have you. And um, yeah, I'm super excited to see what God's going to do uh, here in Faith Welland. So um, yeah, Pastor Dave asked if I would be willing to uh, share a little bit of what God's been doing in my own life through uh, words. And God has truly been refining me and transforming me and even giving me words. Like if uh, you told me a year ago I'd be standing up here talking in front of all of you, uh, I would probably call you crazy. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm definitely thankful for what God has been doing. And he has definitely been stretching me a lot. Um, so when I got asked to do this and started thinking about words. Like, yeah, when I say something to a person, if it's negative, it's going to have a negative effect. When I say something positive, it's going to have a positive effect. And that is totally true. But what is happening on the inside of me is going to determine whether my words are negative or positive. So the outlook on my inside, um, what kind of words am I telling myself? Am I telling myself I can't do whatever it is? Like, um, I can't come up here and speak in front of you because I don't feel safe or I don't feel worthy of being up in front of you. But these are all lies. These are not from God. These are from the enemy. So God... When you invite God into your life and you learn to start saying yes to God and what he has for you and continuously seeking more and more of what God wants for you to do in your life, God gives you a new strength, a new, um, a new language completely and um, just the words to even share. So, yeah. I had a whole paper written out, but I just felt that was on my heart, and um, yeah, so. Well, thank you so much, Nathaniel. I don't have anything to add. You're dismissed. <laughs> well, that's awesome what God does when he gets into a person's life and just brings change, because that's what God is all about, just bringing complete transformation in every area of our life and I love the way that Jesus compares it because when Jesus was talking about this kind of change that happens when you come into a relationship with the father he refers to it as being born again and when you think of a baby being born you know that their life has completely changed who they are outside of the womb is completely different to who they were inside of the womb in an instant, everything has changed. Now, I know there might be some moms in here that said, hold on there, preacher boy. There was nothing instant about that. <laughs> that was the product of 23 hours of intense labor that I'm going to be sure to remind my child of when they get older and they're impatient with me. But the point is, things have changed. You are no longer the same. Birth brings change. And in a spiritual sense, when we're born again, there's a, a significant change that we experience through that process. To, so to start all this off, I want to read our text for the series that we're going to be covering over the next few weeks. And the last part of the text is what we're going to be talking about specifically this morning. So here's what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus... You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its evil, deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. 
Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So to make this passage immediately practical, what God is simply saying here is that there should be a noticeable difference when you come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He brings change. So if you come to God later on in life, people should say, wow, what's different about you? You talk different. You act different. You're not the same person you used to be. And if you've been a Christian for as long as you can remember, people should still say, what is it that is different about you? You know, I love the way that Peter describes Christians in his letter, and I'm going to refer to the translation that I memorized when I was a teenager, and it's found in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, where he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And when you look at this passage, there are certain things that are nice. Chosen generation, we like that. Royal priesthood, that's nice. Holy nation, that's nice. But then it says peculiar people. And we're like, mm, I don't know. And so in some of your more recent translations, it actually changes out peculiar people with God's special possession. But to be honest, I kind of like the peculiar people. Because peculiar people does not necessarily mean weird or odd or strange in a negative sense. But peculiar literally means this. It's a marked difference. So to help illustrate this point, if you take a look at this picture, here in a sea of black umbrellas, there is one umbrella which is a little bit peculiar. It's green. At least I think it's green. I'm kind of colorblind. But it's a different color. And so you might say, well, there's nothing wrong with that umbrella. It's a nice umbrella. It's not odd. It's not weird. It's not strange. It's still a functioning umbrella. It's a useful umbrella. There's just a marked difference. It's different than all the rest. It stands out. Many, many, many years ago, when I was a youth leader back at London Gospel Temple, uh, our youth pastor at that time brought in a special guest speaker for our youth retreat. He brought in a guy by the name of John Bevere. And the only reason I mention his name is because if you're familiar at all with the ministry of John Bevere, you know that he's a no-nonsense kind of guy. He doesn't have to embellish or exaggerate in order to make a point. It is what it is with him. And so he was telling us of what took place when he was a youth pastor in Orlando, Florida, and it's something that has stuck with me for years. In his youth group, there was a young guy who started to come, and he just got radically saved. He was a popular kid at the high school. He was on the football team. He was involved in all of these different activities. And when I say he was radically saved, I mean as soon as he gave his life to Jesus, he made sure everybody knew about it. He would evangelize Everyone in the school, he would get up early and pray for the students in his school. That's kind of what he was doing. Now, he comes in one Friday and he says, Pastor John, I've got to tell you what took place at school this week. While he was at school, a kid came up to him who was involved in a satanic movement. And so this kid says to this new Christian, we don't like what you're doing. And so therefore, I'm going to put a curse on you and you are going to die. And so the Christian kid, as he's telling the story to Pastor John, said, Pastor John, I just started laughing. It, it was something from the inside. It just struck me funny, which really annoyed, for lack of better words, the satanic kid. So the satanic kid then says to him, that's it. I'm going to put a curse on you, and you're going to die tomorrow. It's like, Pastor John, I started laughing even harder. I couldn't help myself, which really annoyed the other kid. He said, that's it. I'm putting a curse on you, and you're going to die tonight. Pastor John, I was on the floor. I was crying. I was laughing so hard. When all of a sudden this bigger kid shoves this young Satanist kid out of the way, says, get out of here. You don't know what you're doing. I stopped laughing because I didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden this bigger kid looks down at this new Christian and says, I'm in that same Satanic movement as he is. I've been in it much longer. That kid is new. What he doesn't realize is that you're one of those marked ones and we can't touch you. Isn't that cool? So now who has a problem with being peculiar? 
a marked difference from God on the inside that is just so significant that sets you apart, identifies you as one who belongs to Jesus. It is so cool what happens when God gets a hold of a person. My very first youth pastor position, I was working at a small church in London, Ontario. A couple of girls started to come to the youth group. They were identical twin sisters. Couldn't tell them apart. They looked the same. They acted the same. They talked the same. Hence the identical part. <clears throat> one Friday, one of the sisters gave her heart to Jesus. And it was so cool to see the transformation because now you have identical twin sisters, one who is now a Christian, the other who is not. And I could tell them apart because the one who was a Christian, there was life behind her eyes. You could tell that she had something there. Her countenance was different. There was Jesus on her and she talked different and she acted different. It was like the coolest thing to see that. And I was happy. Now, primarily because one of them gave their life to Jesus but I was also happy that there was now something that I could use to tell these two apart until her sister gave her life to Jesus, and then I couldn't tell them apart anymore. <laughs> but that's what happens when God gets a hold of a person's life. He brings change, and it goes so much deeper than anything that we can change on the outside. You know, sometimes people will make changes on the outside. They can get cosmetic surgery or change their hair color or get new clothes or different makeup, or different accessories. And these sorts of things may fool some people some of the time. But what God is involved in is a change that starts in the heart and just oozes out from there, affecting every area of their lives. When I was preparing for the message this morning, I was reminded of the story of Samuel. When he was called to go to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons as the next king over all of Israel. Because Samuel was about to learn a very significant lesson. And if you know anything about Samuel, you know this, that he knew the voice of God from a very young age. So it seems like Samuel and God were tight. They listened, or Samuel was able to listen to whatever God was saying. So as Samuel is called to go to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons as the next king over all of Israel... Samuel was about to make a rash decision because as the sons passed before him, all of them except for David, the one that God would actually choose who wasn't even considered an option, who was still out in the shepherd's field somewhere. But when the oldest one stood before Samuel, Samuel made this bold declaration. Surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. But Samuel couldn't have been more wrong. Number one, his name wasn't Shirley. It was Eliab. Number two, Samuel was making a decision based on what he saw. He looked at how tall this guy was. He looked at how good-looking this guy was, and he made the natural assumption, this is God's man. And so God said to Samuel, Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at what people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the question is this, how do you know when a heart has truly been transformed by God? Is there anything that would be an indicator of a changed heart? Well, I'm glad you asked, because God tells us exactly what reveals the heart. Jesus says in the book of Luke chapter 6, verse 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. <clears throat> for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Some of your translations may say, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so therefore, to make it plain, once we come into a relationship with God, there should be a difference in the words that come out of our mouths. Because what we say reveals our heart. And in the passage that we refer to in the book of Ephesians, which is the foundation for this series, God clearly lays out his expectation for our words. Because if your relationship with God, it's like he's saying, well, now that that's in place, first of all, do not let any unwholesome talk come from your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Because we are now in a relationship with God, because everything should be changed 
and he's bringing us through this transformation process, God has now given us the ability, the power to choose the words which come out of our mouths. And we can either choose to be obedient to God, or we can choose to disobey his commands and his expectations as far as our speech is concerned. And I love the way that this passage is laid out. Because if you look at it, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. God is not making a suggestion here. He's not being vague. He's just being as simple and as plain as he needs to be and just says, absolutely, do not let anything come out of your mouth that is unwholesome. And in this command or these instructions with regard to our words, you find that God is being restrictive. Don't let any. He's being permissive. You can say this. And he's also being restrictive in his permissiveness, but only this. So let's jump in. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. The natural follow-up question when you read this verse should be, well, what is unwholesome? Because if God is saying this is 100% unacceptable, don't let any unwholesome talk, well, then it would be good to know what unwholesome actually is. And if you consider it from a different context, say somebody were to offer you food that they would describe as completely unwholesome, what would you say that is? You might look and go, you know what, that's probably not good for me. (laughs) And you would be right. In fact, the actual definition for the word unwholesome is this. Anything detrimental to physical, mental, or moral well-being. So therefore, in context of our passage this morning, what God is saying is, don't let any talk come out of your mouths, which could be detrimental to another person's mental, physical, or moral well-being. Just don't do it. Don't say anything that won't be good for the listeners. For a couple reasons. Number one, God clearly says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And so, out of an act of obedience, say, God, you said this is completely off the table, therefore we will obey. But number two, it follows the principle that Jesus said of the golden rule, which he said is the sum of all the law and the prophets. Back then, leading up to the time of Jesus, all they had was Scripture. And so what Jesus was basically saying here is all the commands that have ever been given by God, and then you add them to all the commands and instructions that have ever been given by the prophets, add those all together, you will get a sum. The sum is basically this, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then as far as our words are concerned, it means talk to other people the way that you would want other people to talk to you. Talk about other people the way that you would like other people to talk about you. That's basically what he is saying here. And this is so important because when it comes to words, we all know that words can hurt. I would hazard a guess to say that every single person in this room today has at one time or another in their lives been on the receiving end of hurtful words. And hurtful words can start early in life. As far back as JK or SK or kindergarten, kids will sometimes use hurtful words against one another. And so therefore, somebody somewhere along the lines came up with this nice little rhyme, which is great in its intention, but it's ultimately not true, which is sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Now, I remember my mom teaching me this little rhyme when I was going to elementary school, especially because I was a painfully shy kid, like ridiculously shy. And so when you're going to school with a last name like Tunicitis, (laughs) a name that sounds like some sort of fish disease, And you're surrounded by classmates who have normal sounding names like Gilbert and Smith and Sanders and Jones. And then all of a sudden you throw a tunicitis in there. You are going to get all kinds of fish jokes, which I did. I got tuna fish, tuna salad, tuna sandwich, tuna melt. I even got this one. And the musicians in this place might appreciate this. I got, you can tuna guitar. You can tune a piano, but you can't tune a kitus. <laughs> that one was from a teacher. <laughs> now, obviously, I'm okay with it now. 
I embrace my inner fish now. <laughs> but back then, I was completely devastated because my mom didn't tell me that there was anything unusual about our last name. And so when we had kids, we prepped them like, listen, just so you know, when you start school, you're probably going to get a lot of tuna jokes. I'm okay now, but back then the words hurt. Because here's the thing. There is so much power in words. That's why the Bible says in the book of Proverbs 18 to 21, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Words have that unique ability to either build somebody up or tear somebody down. And they can be absolutely destructive to a person's mental or moral well-being. You know, over the years, I have physically injured myself many, many times. My body bears the scars of many an injury. Some of them are severe. And if I were to look back at the times where I've injured myself, the one thing I remember is that that hurt a lot. But I don't actually relive the pain. I just know that that hurt. However, if I go back in my mind and I think about the times that hurtful words have been spoken to me, against me, and I mean words that go so far beyond the innocent joking about a name. I'm talking about malicious, hurtful words that if people have said against me and will say with the intention of being hurtful, if I allow myself to go back and relive that and picture myself in the setting, you can still feel a measure of pain. And I know that you know what I'm talking about because that is the power of words that's why the rhyme should almost be changed to something like this. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will scar me forever. Could you please just throw rocks? <laughs> you know, it's no wonder God says, don't be part of this process. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. It is not good for the person on the receiving end of your words. You can do so much damage to them. More damage than what you're probably even intending. But the reality is, not only is God trying to protect the listener, see, we serve a God who works all things together for our good. God is also trying to protect us as well. I mean, have you ever said something to somebody and thought, ooh, I shouldn't have said that? Have you ever released some words out of your mouth and you wish that you could take them back because you saw the damage that your words did? And so God is trying to protect us from our own words. I remember being at a board member's house watching Super Bowl 38 when I was in Gravenhurst. Now, Super Bowl 38 was pretty unique because the day after Super Bowl 38, there was not a whole lot of people actually talking about the game. What people were actually talking about was the halftime show and the infamous wardrobe malfunction that took place during that game. And so when you're the pastor of a church watching the game with board members and their families and that happens, it makes it really awkward. It's like, oh, wow, what just happened? <laughs> now, I was a little surprised that this was not already in place. But because of what took place in the halftime show, the network said we can no longer show the halftime show Live, we have to implement a seven-second delay. So just in case anything inappropriate like that happens in the future, we can cut the feed before it goes out to millions and millions of people. Which makes me think, don't you wish that there was like a seven-second delay on your words? <laughs> that as soon as you said something, it just hung out there like a visible bubble that you could take a couple seconds just to analyze like, yeah, okay, that's good. Send. Or you kind of release and you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> Woo. No, I cannot release that one. I'm just going to delete that one before it hits its intended target. But the reality is, obviously, we do not have a seven-second delay. And once a word is out there, it's out there. And so God is so adamant by saying, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Meaning this, before you express your thoughts, Run it through this filter. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. What you are about to say, could it be interpreted as unwholesome? Will this be detrimental to the person you are talking to? And if it is, rethink your words. 
Because how many of you know you never have to take back anything you didn't say? But once a word is out there, it's out there. Stop yourself and get to the instruction in the second part of the verse. Now before I move on to what it is that God says you can say, I have one last thought about unwholesome words. And Nathaniel actually referred to it. Do you notice that when God says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, he doesn't really identify a target. He doesn't say, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths against somebody else. It's like, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, period. And I know some of you might say, well, Pastor Dave, that's not a period, that's a comma. But I know it's a continuing thought, but you can have, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, period, and that would be a complete thought. Because here's the thing, sometimes we are our own worst enemy when it comes to our words. Sometimes we will speak death over ourselves. We will speak unwholesome words over ourselves. We use words over ourselves that do not line up with God, that do not line up with Scripture, and we become our own worst enemy. Every time we say things like, I'm so stupid, or I'm not good enough, or I'm such a loser, I'm such a failure, I'll never be able to achieve that. This is an impossible situation. Nobody cares about me. God is not listening. God doesn't care. None of those things are based on reality. None of those things are based on truth. It is all unwholesome talk that we bring about on ourselves. You know, we have no control of what somebody else might say about us. Somebody can speak against you. Somebody can speak unwholesome words to you. And you have no control over that. All you can do in that moment is just pray that God would guard your heart so that whatever it is that they say about you, you don't start to define yourself based on their opinion. You can say, well, I appreciate you say that about me, but I know who created me. I know what God says about me. And so therefore, I will line up my thoughts with his opinion of me, not yours. But the thing is, if we don't like it when other people say those things against us, why do we at times do that to ourselves? Why do we just partner in and just become our own worst enemy? Now, if I can be real with you this morning, and Charlotte knows that this is true, and how many of you guys know that nobody knows you like your wife? If ever I find myself in a place where my thoughts are not lined up with what the Bible says, I find myself in a place where my thoughts are not healthy, and then you might be saying, but wait a minute, you're a pastor. Your thoughts are always supposed to be healthy. But there's times when they're not. And if I find myself over here and Charlotte says, what's wrong? Or if she says, are you okay? I will try as best as I can to hold on to my words. And more recently, what I've done is this. If she says, are you okay? I might just say, not right now, but I will be. I will be. And sometimes I'll even give a timeline. You know, I'm not right now, but probably in the morning, I will be. Because right now, my thoughts do not line up with what Scripture says. And if I were to express my thoughts, and I will say that to her, it's like, I know that if I were to share what I'm feeling right now, it doesn't line up. And so therefore, I don't want to say anything, because as soon as I say something, I know that I'm going to have to repent for these words that I'm saying right now, because I know that they don't line up with what Scripture says, so I need time. I need time to work this out, what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, where the Bible says we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Jesus Christ. If your thoughts are bringing you to the point where you are about to release unwholesome words over somebody else or maybe even over yourself, take some time to get this in place. And sometimes it takes time to get this in place. Because one thing I've discovered about trying to capture something, whatever it is you're trying to capture does not want to be captured. And I better explain that really quickly. It's like, what, what are you trying to take captive? Well, say for an example, a mouse gets into the house. And I'm not talking about the times where you see evidence of a mouse somewhere, so you lay some traps and then the next day you caught your mouse. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's happened to us once where I have opened the door and this mouse just comes darting in. So now it's me and the mouse. And the mouse is in the middle of the living room. And the mouse is looking at me and I'm looking at the mouse and I want to capture the mouse. 
Just because I identify what needs to be captured doesn't mean that it's done. The mouse doesn't just go, oh, you got me. I'll just stay right here while you just grab me and do whatever you want to do to this mouse. The mouse will say, there is no way that I'm going to be caught without a fight. And so the mouse is going to run. The mouse is going to hide. There's going to be a lot of screaming in the house. And that's from me, not from the girls. <laughs> because it doesn't want to be captured. And I find that sometimes the thoughts are the exact same way. When your thoughts are not in the right place, and I will find myself literally battling this out. Here's what I'm thinking. But I know the Bible says this. But here's what I'm feeling. But I know the Bible says this. Well, here's my circumstance. But here's what the Bible says about your circumstance. Yeah, but my circumstances are not reflecting what the Bible says. And on and on and on this can go until finally I will find myself getting to the place where I'm like, wait a minute. Enough. God, I know what you say. I know what your word says. I know that you are not a liar. I know that my circumstances change, but you don't. I know that your ways are higher than my ways. I know your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I know that you work all things together for my good. I know that you order my steps. So even though I may not fully understand my circumstances, the one thing I do know is that you have always been faithful. And so I will trust in you more than I will trust in my circumstances. And then I get my thoughts into this mental mind shift of a healthier place. And when that happens then I'm okay to talk because I know now that the words that come out of my mouth will line up, they will be obedient to Christ, and I will speak life as opposed to death because there is so much power in the spoken word. It's our scriptural foundation for this morning. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And then the second part of the verse is this, but only what is helpful for the building of others up according to their needs, that I may benefit those who listen. So therefore, in the same way that we speak death over ourselves from time to time, we can also speak life over ourselves. We can speak life over other people. And it's the other thing that the tongue is great at doing, speaking life. Before I got into ministry, I ran a small promotional company for about seven years. It was just... Small, we had like a, a graphic artist, we had a receptionist, and we had a young kid that would come in and do all the, the dirty work that is sometimes involved in a printing company. So they would, he would be in there cleaning the screens and getting the screens ready for the next job and burning the images into them and organizing the inventory. And I so appreciated my little team there, and I would tell them quite often how great they are. Now, during that time, I also learned an adage, which I found to be quite true, which is this. People will work harder for praises than they will for raises. And so I would often tell my graphic artist, you, you are so great. The way that a customer comes in and they are starting a company, they want to come up with a logo, and you just sort of like talk them through and then you create this amazing logo that they're happy with. I love the way that your brain works because I couldn't do that. I would say to the receptionist, you are so great at a first point of contact when people call. You're the first thing that they hear when, when they call into this little business to place their order. When you have to do follow-up calls if a person is like 60 or 90 days overdue, the way you handle that is so professional. I so appreciate having you here. To the young kid who would come in every day after school and do all the stuff that nobody else wanted to do, but he would do it so faithfully. I would say how much I appreciated them, that all three of them were just so instrumental to the success of our little company. Now, I didn't learn the adage and then say it to them. I said it to them, learned the adage, and go, hey, you know what? That's actually true. And there are times where it would be like a Thursday or Friday, and a customer would come in, and they would place this large order, and I would look and think, if we take this order, because they want it rushed, they want it by the middle of next week, that means I'm going to be in here all day on Saturday. I'm going to be here all day on Sunday printing I didn't want the staff to come in because I wanted them to have their weekends off, but I didn't want to lose the customer either, so I said, yeah, okay, we can do it. I would show up on a Saturday morning, and next thing you know, the staff would be there. I'm like, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, well, we can't let you work here by yourself. They were like so ridiculously loyal, which caused me to praise them even more, which caused them to be even more loyal. It's amazing the power that is in the spoken word when you choose to speak life over somebody. 
And it doesn't even have to be all that complicated. I was a teenager back in the 1980s. And back then, we didn't have all kinds of devices to entertain us on a Saturday afternoon. If we wanted entertainment on a Saturday afternoon, we went to the shopping mall. Because if you could walk around the mall with your friends and you had a little bit of money in your pocket, you could go to the food court, it was great. You got to hang out with your buddies and just do whatever it is that we did back then. But what was really cool is if the mall had an arcade. Because that was right at the beginning when all of these machines were just starting to come into play. And it's like, wow, if you could go to a mall with a pocket full of quarters and play Space Invaders and Asteroids and Defender and Qbert and Frogger, and then you broke for lunch, and then you came back, you went to the arcade, that was a good day. So I spent a lot of weekends in the mall. And the biggest mall closest to us was not in St. Thomas, it was in a city just down the road called London, and the big mall that everybody would like to go to was White Oaks Mall in London, Ontario. And so London was actually also where I met my wife, Charlotte. And so years later, when Charlotte and I were just in the initial part of our relationship, I remember being at White Oaks Mall with her and her just saying, oh, I have to go to this store. I'm like, well, I know where that store is. We have to go down this corridor, turn right, and it's right there on the left. And she looks at me and like, how do you know that? It's like, yeah. I have spent way too many weekends in this mall. I know where everything is. And she's like, well, after that, I have to go to this store. I was like, well, in order to get to that store, we have to go here because it's in that other end of the mall. And so we'll just do this store first and then that store. Now, she just looks at me and she says, you know what? I love shopping with you <laughs> because you know how to navigate a mall. Well, as soon as she said that, I turned into this guy, super mall guy. It was like, hey, my girl wants to go shopping. She needs to know where the stores are. Come on. Let me prove to you I know this mall. And I just kind of took it upon as a challenge. Give me the most obscure mall or the obscure store in this mall. I will find it for you. It's, it seems almost stupid, but it was just a little word of encouragement. You know what? You're so good at this. And by her saying that, it caused something to rise up on the inside of me where it's like, yeah, I want to show you that I can live up to your expectation of who I am. Super mall guy. Now, I'm going to say this publicly. Please don't let the takeaway from this morning be this afternoon. Oh, you know what, honey? You're great at painting a house. I just love the way you landscape a garden. <laughs> if you've never done it before, then they'll know, wait a minute. I don't think that's what Pastor Dave was meaning when he was preaching this morning. But the point is there's so much power in the spoken word. And here's the coolest thing. When your life is transformed by a relationship with Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God is now living on the inside of you, then you can actually partner with God and use your words from God to absolutely make a change in a person's life far greater than what you can possibly imagine. See, the Bible says in Psalm 10, 11, the words of the godly are a life-giving fountain. The words of the wicked conceal violent intentions. Proverbs 10, 32, the lips of the godly speak helpful words, but the mouth of the wicked speaks perverse words. I'm just going to call the worship team back. I have one more story to share before I close. And I apologize to the junior highs. I have the privilege of every once in a while going down and teaching the junior high Sunday school. So many of them have heard this story before. But when I knew that I was going to be talking about the power of words, this story just came back. That I, I got to close with this one. Back in the 1990s, it seemed like God was doing something so unique in so many different churches. There was just a move of the Holy Spirit of God that was really, really cool to witness. And I was just coming back into the things of God back in the 1990s. And so all of these things were kind of new to me. But in a church service, it would not be unusual to see people laughing in the Spirit or crying in the Spirit as God was bringing restoration in their lives or being what was known as being slain in the Spirit. And that doesn't mean that God killed you. It just means that 
you were so overwhelmed by the presence and the power of God that you couldn't stand. And people would often just be found laying all over the floors on altars as they were just having this great moment with God. Well, the church at that time was going to be bringing in this special guest speaker. He was going to speak to the young adults on a Thursday night and to the youth group on a Friday night and then to the church on a Sunday. And so my best friend calls me and says, hey, Dave, are you going to the young adult service tonight? I said, oh, yeah, absolutely, because this guy has some sort of really cool anointing on him, and that when he calls an altar, it's not unusual to see these manifestations of God. I want to be part of that. So I went there on the Thursday night with my friend Glenn, and I can't remember what it is that he preached on, but I do remember that when he called the altar, and the altar was something like, if you want more of the presence, the power of God, just come on up, and we all did. And so here we are as young adults all lined up across the front as this guy then began to pray for us. And as he's praying for the young adults, they were just drop, drop, drop. Some of them were like crying. Some of them were laughing. Some of them were just experiencing this peaceful moment in the presence of God. And I was thinking, oh, man, this is kind of cool. I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Now, the instructions that was given to us was that we were supposed to just focus on Jesus. And so there I am. In the line, I got my arms raised. Oh, Jesus, you're awesome. You're so worthy. And I knew that he was coming close. And I'm trying to focus on Jesus, but I just know that he's coming close and it's going to be my turn soon. Next thing you know, he just touches me on the forehead, says whatever it is that he was saying, and then moved on. And I stood there. Nothing. I remember opening up my eyes and looking, and there's all the people to my left on the floor having this amazing time with God. I look to the right, people are falling, having this amazing time with God. And because I was just coming into the things of God again and not really fully understanding how everything worked, I reasoned to myself incorrectly because Benny Hinn was on the rise back then as well. And I thought, oh, Benny Hinn must have shot up an emergency prayer request just as this guy was praying for me. So God was distracted. And so I literally got out of line and I went over here. I was like, God, you missed me. But I'm going to give you a second chance. And so he's praying for people, and they're going down, going down, going down. And I'm right here, ready to receive whatever God has for me. He touches me on the forehead. Nothing. This person goes down. This person goes down. This person goes down. The only people who were not experiencing this really cool thing from God was myself and my best friend, Glenn. And when you are in an entire room where everybody is receiving something from God except for you, Man, your thoughts start to become unwholesome. What's wrong with you? What did you do? Why doesn't God like you? Why doesn't God love you? Why doesn't he want you to have this experience that everybody else is having? I remember leaving the church that night, walking out the door. I was so sad. I was embarrassed. And you know sometimes you say really stupid things to God? Maybe you don't, but I did. I'm walking out of the door and I said to God, God... If I were to step off of the face tonight, you wouldn't even notice. Now the cool thing is God's not sarcastic because God could have just said, okay, go ahead, try. It's like, oh, God, you know I can't do that. You made the earth round and you put gravity in place. But that's how I felt, that God just didn't want to notice me. The next day was Friday. My friend calls me and says, Dave, are you going to the service tonight because that guy's going to be here? I said, No. No, I, I don't want to go. Why would I put myself through that again? That was absolutely embarrassing. If God wanted me to have this special moment with him, it could have happened Thursday, so I'm not going to go. And I didn't go. The next day was Saturday. I get a phone call at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's my friend, Glenn. Dave, you totally missed it. It was awesome. I went up to the altar and the guy prayed for me and I went down like a sack of potatoes and I just started laughing in the spirit. I didn't stop laughing until about 2 o'clock this morning. You know, the Bible says this in the book of Proverbs, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. And man, did that verse become a reality to me on that Saturday morning. Because now, and I'm starting to reason all of these things out incorrectly, I was like, ah, I get it, God. 
The only reason that my friend didn't receive the special thing with you on Thursday is because I was with him. And it's almost like God was saying, well, now that that loser's not here, I can minister to you. Sunday morning rolled around, and I went to church, but I didn't want to be there. I didn't feel like participating in worship. I don't know what the pastor preached on. I didn't respond to the altar, because at this point in time, I'm thinking, what is the point? I am in such a bad place mentally. Sunday night rolls around. I still went to church. I don't know why I was there. I didn't participate in worship. I didn't listen to the preaching. I didn't respond to the altar. The pastor closes everything off. The worship team packed up their instruments. Everybody's clearing out. I was sitting beside my friend Glenn. And Glenn looks at me and says, Dave, I, th I think I have a word from God for you. At that point, I, I didn't even really care. I was like, okay, whatever, what is it? And he's like, you know what, I feel so stupid sharing this because it seems just so obvious. And I've actually had this since this morning. And as we were sitting through the service tonight, it just kept growing and growing and growing. It's like, I have to tell Dave this. I was like, okay, well, what is it? And he just looks at me and he says, Dave, God really loves you. And he wants you to continue to be obedient. And as soon as he said that, the lies that I wound around myself for three days all of a sudden broke. And I started sobbing, like literally just sobbing. And it shocked him. And he kind of takes a step back. He's like, whoa, I guess that was from God. See, because he didn't want to share it because it was so obvious. You can look into the Bible and see example, example, example of the love of God. Hearing about the love of God is one of the first songs you learn about in Sunday school. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But what he didn't realize is that for three days I was wrestling with the reality of the love of God. And I was fully convinced that God loved everybody, but he did not love me. And as soon as he said that, something broke, and my heart was filled with the love of God. And I just started sobbing, and I realized at that moment, God, it doesn't matter if I experience you, if I don't experience you. The reality is you love me, and I am a child of God, regardless of the lies that I tried to say to myself, regardless of what people might try to say against me. This is who I am because this is what you say about me. It was absolutely life-transforming, something as simple as that. The tongue has the power of life and death. You can literally change a person's life by something as simple as saying, you know what? Let me just share this with you. Because when I look back over my life, that was a life-changing moment for me. And I am fully convinced that had he not done that, I wouldn't be here this morning. It's amazing what God can do. Your words don't have to be deep. Your words don't have to connect a whole bunch of deep spiritual dots together. God knows what somebody needs to hear. This is why the Bible says the right word at the right time is like custom-made piece of jewelry. The right word at the right time is absolutely, perfectly suited for the listener. And when you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you can partner with God to speak life over to somebody else. Whether they're in the church, whether it's in your family, whether it's your neighbors, whether it's your co-workers, you can choose to speak life. Can we stand as we pray? When Pastor Jamie asked if I could preach on this topic this morning, before I had any of the message, what I had was this moment right here. And we're just gonna take a couple moments for those that may want to choose to respond. Because what was so strong in my heart is that there's gonna be people here and you are still carrying around the wounds of unwholesome talk that has been spoken over you. Whether it's from a loved one, whether it's from a friend, whether it's from an authority member, whether unwholesome words have been spoken over you and you've done it to yourself. Please don't leave here the same way that you came. Can we just take a couple minutes that if that is you to come up to the altar and say, you know what, God, I'm just leaving that here. I'm just going to leave all those lies right here. And I'm going to walk out here free. Don't worry about the mess up here. We'll take care of that tomorrow. I'll be more than happy to get rid of all the negativity that has been spoken over your life. 
But I just want to encourage you just to come if that's you and just say, you know what, I'm leaving it here and I'm just going to allow God to give me a revelation of who I actually am. That if you are in a relationship with God, you are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. You are a child of God. Number two, if you happen to be in the church and there's something that's been stirring on the inside of you, a word of encouragement, maybe for somebody within the church, maybe for somebody that you're in a relationship with, please do not hang on to that word. Just share it. Why wouldn't we just share life to those around us? You know, I love the story of what Glenn did for me, but then there's part of me is like, what do you mean you had that since this morning? He could have told me that this morning and made my Sunday a lot better. But I was still glad that he finally got around to the point of sharing it. But God knows exactly what a person needs to hear. And if it's in you, it's in you for a reason. And God might be saying, you know what, I want you just to go touch base with that somebody. And you might wrestle it out saying, oh God, but it's so obvious. Of course they know that. But the right word at the right time, you don't know what it is that they're going through. And if you just take the time to speak life, it can absolutely be life transforming. So as the worship team begins to play, if this is you here this morning, and say, you know what, I just want to take a few minutes around the altar to drop off all of these lies and walk out of here with a true revelation of who God is, then please don't hesitate. Just come.